What's up, everyone? Matt from Hot Music, Appleton, Wisconsin. And we have Michael Pittman from Appleton, Wisconsin, one of the high music enthusiasts here. And he is actually going to work with you on the bassoon. That's yeah. exciting. That is so, what I'm doing today. All right, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Michael Pittman. Hey, so if you've seen him before, I'm in the Appleton and Yashkosh stores, and I play the bassoon. That's my primary instrument. I'm a woodman's guy, and I've moved around. I started out in Washington. I've moved to Florida and in Indiana, and now I'm here in Wisconsin. And I play bassoon as my primary instrument. So that's a little bit about me. And I have my bassoon here. Uh, if you guys play bassoon out there, your bassoon might look a little bit different, and that's okay. We all have different looking bassoons and everything. Don't mind me, I'm just moving a stand over a little bit. So the bassoon is one of those very unique instruments. A lot of us start on something different. I actually started on clarinet in fifth grade, and then I played some bass clarinet, and then I moved to bassoon in seventh grade. I actually also added saxophones in high school, and uh, I added oboe eventually too. So I do most of the woodwinds. But bassoon's always kind of that first love, and it's what I studied in college for about eight years. So when I first started out, I had a black looking bassoon, which is what a lot of uh, middle schools will have. Um, that's just a high plastic. It's a polypropylene material as opposed to a wooden bassoon. Maybe you've seen the wooden ones before. So it's just a little bit different material. Okay. Uh, so the, po the plastic polypropylene black ones, they're very durable and they do great. Okay? They are fantastic for starting out on. Eventually you get to a wooden one, which will look like this. And that's okay that yours doesn't look like this quite yet. Also, I'm using a harness today so I can stand. A lot of times, you'll be wanting to use a seat strap, like in band, when you're sitting with everyone else, a lot of your practicing is going to be with a seat strap. Mine has a cup on it. A lot of them will have a hook that hooks onto the bottom. It will circle onto the bottom of the boot joint, or sometimes a cup. It'll just slide right on. But today, uh, for the sake of this, I'm using a harness so I can stand and kind of show things a little better. So bear with me. I'm just rolling this up for a second. So a lot of people... You know, my parents weren't musicians and they had no idea really what a bassoon was. They knew what a clarinet was when I started. And, but the clarinet, it wasn't exactly a home for me. I, I didn't like the register of the clarinet as much anymore, the higher notes, and I wanted something lower. And that's why I tried bass clarinet for a bit, but it still didn't do it for me. So I did a lot of research on the internet and eventually I found the bassoon. And I asked my band director in seventh grade, hey, I wonder if I can play the bassoon. Do we have one at school? And he said, yeah, just bring in a reed and we'll try it out. So whether or not you play bassoon yet, or maybe you're a clarinet player who's interested, or a saxophone, or a flute player, or maybe you play brass, or even percussion, and you're interested in bassoon, it's a little different from a mouthpiece than what you've seen. Oboes and bassoons are double reed instruments, okay? as opposed to a clarinet and a saxophone that has one reed against the plastic mouthpiece or a rubber mouthpiece. My mouthpiece is made out of two reeds here. It grows just like kind of the big thing of bamboo, and then it has to be cut down and processed into these two reeds, and these vibrate to make a sound. <laughs> we call that a crow on the bassoon reed, and you can uh, manipulate the sound of it. <laughs> and so that's gonna go onto the bassoon, and all those vibrations are gonna go through and make some noise. That's how noise works, is through vibrations, just like through a brass mouthpiece into the instrument, uh, that clarinet mouthpiece that goes onto the clarinet, the flute head joint, that is how we make the sound. So for reeds, you may be asking, well, where do I get my reeds? If you're a bassoon player, you're probably asking that. Where do I get reeds? What are good reeds? What are the best reeds? So professional bassoonists like myself will make their own reeds a lot of the time. Um, as you can see, my reeds probably look quite a bit different than what you're used to if you're a bassoonist. Uh, it doesn't have that thread on there. And I choose to do that for my own personal opinion. Uh, when you go into stores like Hyde Music, uh, there'll be a couple different read options. Jones, Lesher, Emerald are very common ones. Uh, you may be asking, well, what's the best one? The answer is, there is no answer. Everyone's built differently. So every read works a little bit differently for them. When I was in junior high school, I played on a lot of, lot of Jones reads and I tried Emerald reads, but they didn't work well for me. And it's just trial and error of figuring out where, what works best for you. So I tried a bunch of different reads. I played on a lot of Jones throughout junior high. In high school, I was playing on a different read. Uh, some reads my teacher was making, 
and adjusting my reads. Um, and then eventually I started making my own reads, which you may be thinking, well, reads are expensive. I should just start making my own reads. That is very difficult unless you have a private teacher guiding you because it takes a lot of work and a lot of years of knowledge to learn how to adjust. My thing that I always tell all double read players is you really should get into lessons because that's, you need someone who's gonna be a specialist. Band directors are great and they know tons of stuff and a lot of things you know, work so well, but I mean, it's hard to know all the little intricacies on every instrument and double reads are very different unless they're actually a double read player. It's, it's hard to know everything. Um, so with reads, also you should have plenty of reads ready to go. Now this is a large read case. I fit 10 reads in here. I, I have some more sitting off to the side. So generally I recommend my, my students to have three reads at a time ready to go. Because if you get to a lesson and one read is being a little finicky, you better have a backup read. You know, you, you can't come to a concert and just have one read ready to go. So getting a read case that can hold at least three reads is great. And that way you can rotate. Your reads will last longer if you plan a different read every day that you don't stay on the same one. Otherwise, they're going to wear out a lot faster. Generally, when I start uh, getting ready to play bassoon, I soak my reads and I soak about three at a time. I toss the whole thing in and then... I just have it ready, just kind of getting soaked. Um, it takes a little bit to over soak your reads, but that is possible. So a few minutes uh, while you're setting up your bassoon and then kind of play through your reads and see which one's gonna do best for your situation. Uh, but you always do need to soak up your reads. It's, it's not just put on the read and start playing because then your read is liable to crack. It can be a, a big issue because then you're out of a read and that is a lot of money for a read. Okay, so if you're new to bassoon or you're just learning more, uh, so we have some parts on the bassoon. We have the reed, as we've talked about a lot. We have this little metal piece that is called the vocal, and that connects into the tenor joint or the wing joint and goes down one side of the bassoon into the boot joint, which has a big U-tube in there and curves back up into the long joint and out the bell. Okay. <laughs> so I just always crow before I put my reed onto the bassoon. Okay, so as I said, it was interesting to me being the low register. I wanted those low notes, which bassoon can play those low notes. But what I came to learn was bassoon will have a really large range. It can play very low, like I just played, or it can play kind of high. It has quite an expansive range on it. Um, which you'll you'll get there. It just takes a little bit of practice. Okay. So uh, I'm going to get into some practice tips and things like that. But first, I want to talk about embouchure for a little bit. Um, I've seen a lot of students come to me that have some irregular embouchures. Uh, and it can also be affected by what you play before the bassoon. Some people think you really need this clamping kind of embouchure. Or your lips are really rolled in and it's almost like you're biting onto the reed that's not good because it's going to kind of deaden the vibrations. How I teach embouchure is to go through some vowels. And I have all my students say A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. So when you say E, your corners of your mouth are really stretched out. And that's the exact opposite of what we want to do for bassoon embouchure. We want more of that O. It's going to make a cushion around the reed and bring those corners in. We don't need to roll our lips completely in because that can deaden some vibrations. Everyone's built a little differently, so some amount of lips may show differently. Depending on how thin your lips are or how thick your lips are, you may have some more showing. That's just a little bit of trial and error. Now, when you're playing bassoon, you wanna make sure your posture is good. If you're sitting, you know, you don't, a, a poor uh, tendency for bassoonists is to kind of lean forward. And that's gonna cause kind of some back problems and be a little weird. Also, if you're leaning back, that can really change your airflow and be very uncomfortable. With your arms, you want them very relaxed. Minimal tension from the, from the shoulders. You don't want to be playing kind of out like this. That's awkward, and you could actually hurt yourself. So just relax. You want to just sit and chill. Bassoon is kind of a, a chill instrument, just hanging out. So let's talk about some practicing, some good practice tips. I know it's summer, and you don't have your band music, but there's plenty of things to keep playing. 
Now, I like having a practice regiment. That's what keeps me structured in how I practice. So one of the first things I practice every time, which everyone should be practicing, is your favorite, long tones. Okay, maybe it's not your favorite, but everyone needs to do them. It's just like your vegetables, and it's going to help you get a good bassoon sound. I hear a lot of uh, young students where it's a very poor, unsupported sound, kind of like... We want to work on our tone and support. And that's all from this abdominal muscle down here. It's that same muscle that you use for sit-ups and gym. It's those same muscles that you feel when you have a very good cough, or when you really press, or a good laugh. <laughs> a big deep laugh. That's those same muscles. So how I practice my long tones, I use this fancy device called the metronome and a tuner. Yes, it works wonders. So I generally have the metronome going around 60 beats per minute. And then I have the tuner on my stand too, and I can visually see what the intonation is going to be. So typically, I will do four whole notes. For the first whole note, I'm staying as piano as possible. On the second whole note, I'm crescendoing to as loud as possible, but keeping a good tone and making sure my pitch stays consistent. And then I'm decrescendoing for the third whole note. And for the fourth whole note, I'm staying soft. And sometimes I hold it out basically as long as possible. So you want to take a nice deep breath, okay? Just a big breath. You don't want a breath that's going to raise your shoulders. You want a breath that's going to be here, right in all these, right in your midsection, okay? So let me demonstrate. Some notes are a little bit harder than others. Doing that in your low register might be pretty difficult. When your high register might be difficult. And then there's just some weird notes in the middle. But that's why we practice to get better. You can also do the opposite, where you start as loud as possible, a crescendo, and then crescendo at the end. Just reverse of what I just did. But it's important to watch that needle on the tuner, that it's not fluctuating too much. Listening to your tone, staying right with the metronome, a lot of those factors. You can also focus on how you begin and end the note. Kind of that first articulation and the release. You don't want kind of that poppy sound. You don't want, you don't, you know, you're trying for a more soft articulation. Kind of like a dog. And when you end the note, you want to focus on that cutting it off. You don't want, you want more of a nice round release. So something that can resonate, which all that is is just a fancy word that means kind of echo in the room. Okay? So long tones, really focusing on that. And I'm not saying you need to spend 10 minutes a day on that. You know, just a few minutes at the start just to warm up the bassoon. You know, one or two minutes, kind of just do that, get into the groove of things. And sometimes you might say, well, you know, I'm just going to practice this one day a week and do... 10 minutes of long tones and not do them the rest of the week, it's better to do a little bit every day than one in one big chunk. I'm sure a lot of your band directors have said things similar to that. Now, another thing that I like to practice in my regiment are articulation exercises, really focusing how you articulate on the double reed. It's different from a single reed mouthpiece. It's different from how you tongue on flute or trumpet. It's different how you tongue on percussion too. Yes, that was funny. So, uh, I like to think of a ta as a neutral syllable. Some people might have a little different idea of what a neutral syllable is, but that's what I recommend. So that, I will always make sure to use this fancy thing, the metronome. So this time I put it onto the 80, and I kind of want to make sure I'm playing very evenly with this and making sure my articulations are smooth every time. And just on a neutral note, so I'm going to take that, I'm going to actually take a C in the staff instead of the F and just play eighth notes first. And maybe you're not ready
ready for that fast, you know, maybe you want to start at 60. It's more important that you're playing it consistently and correctly. If you practice bad habits, they're going to embed in you. And it's going to be harder to break those habits than, you know, starting out fresh and doing it correctly from the start. So if you need to start out slower, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay? If you're a little bit more advanced, maybe you want to do 16th notes. And how I do this exercise is they're going 16th note, quarter note, rest, 16th note, quarter note, rest. And I can you know, kind of do that all in chunk, working on my articulation. Then, of course, I want to get a little bit faster until it gets, you know, you don't want to get to that point where it gets too out of control. You want to make sure all the notes are working out. But making sure you have smooth articulation. You can also practice slower and do that with tenuto articulations, so they're very connected, going. You know, those eight notes are very connected. Or you can go staccato. Make sure you're really controlling that air from your abdominal muscles. And really focus and listen. A lot of playing is listening and really, you know, being aware of that. Now, another good thing, scales. Everyone's favorite. I actually do love scales, so that's me. Maybe you're you're still starting out and you go, well, I can kind of get an F major scale. Okay? And that's okay. Hey, that's better than nothing. It's true. Everyone's got to start from somewhere. So you can go really slow. And what I like is still doing this metronome and still doing the tuner and having that going on. You know, I'm looking right at it. I'm going to do just an octave F major scale, just, just up though. And just making sure it's very smooth. I'm doing it slow right now. Of course, you want to get to that part where you work on technique, but you also want to make sure your fingers are moving very precisely. It's almost, you know, that mechanical kind of idea, but we do need some, we don't need to think of it too mechanical like just it's not just opening valves and things like that okay so maybe that's that's your whole range and that's okay maybe your range is doing two octaves on f major scale and maybe it's going great that's fine and then also sliding on on arpeggio arpeggios are always great and I like to do them slur because you can't hide some of those awkward notes that are in that second octave and the third octave. But you can't hide them by, by doing an articulation. You want to make sure those are very smooth. And a lot of that to make them smoother is through how you use your air. Another good thing with scales is guess what? The scale, yeah, you can do F to F, but maybe your lowest note that you can play is down to that B flat. You could always go down to the B flat and back up and keep all the same notes in the scale. Like if I take the one octave F, yeah, maybe you're going to go down to a low F, but everything, all those notes were still in the scale. So I practice the whole range that I can do on my scales. If you're doing one octave, stick to that, work on that, and then start to extend your range, okay? If you're doing two octaves, same thing, start extending your range, okay? Because you want to get to those, to those higher notes that you're going to see more in your advanced middle school music into high school music, because you're going to start getting asked more often the Gs above the staff, As, even higher than that, okay? So keep practicing that, doing your chromatic scales, always wonderful okay and just pick a couple scales if you're in your uh, minor scales keep doing those too in my regimen then i go on to etudes okay so etude all that is is just means exercise and doing different musical exercises i'm going to set this down for a second and i do have a bassoon stand right here you just can't see it on the camera i'll show you it later though Sometimes you do also need to kind of re-soak up your reed just to get a little bit more water in it. And that's that's all I'm doing off camera. 
So with etudes, one of the things, one of the books that I got towards the end of junior high into high school that I used for my private lessons too, was this wonderful book, which is called The Weisenborn, written by a bassoonist in the 1800s. This is what we call the Ambrosio cover. It's just the name of this edition. There's a couple different editions. This is the one I recommend. And as you can see, this is a new one. This is mine. As you can see, I got a little bit hungry and uh, it's been well loved and taken notes all through. So this is what I read off of. A little, little different than the new version, but it's uh, well loved. So there's all different exercises in here. And I'll kind of just go through a little bit here. Um, and it's all varying in ability. There's stuff that you can start out in junior high with in the beginning. And there's stuff at the end that gets incredibly tough that people in college can do, you know, and start working at. So I'm just going to take one or two and how I kind of practice these. So for those of you keeping score that have a version of this book at home, which I don't know if any of you do, or maybe you'll get one and then watch this video again. I am going to start with one on page 14, which that's one that I have a lot of my, my uh, earlier students do because there's a lot of good different things to worry about. So on this first line, it's just quarter notes and half notes with a rest thrown in every once in a while. And I'll play it for you just once. So, you know, I played it, and maybe some of you are saying, oh, man, that was good. My thought, though, was there were things I definitely could have been better. I didn't like some of my articulations on the repeated notes. Um, my, my tempo was pretty good. It was, an, it was a slow run tempo. It's marked on Dante. Uh, maybe I would practice it with the metronome a little bit more and just have the metronome clicking in the background to get me to really solidify the beat that's going on and really feel that, make sure my eighth notes are very even towards the end. Maybe uh, I would really listen for the pitch a little bit better. And so another thing that, oh, uh, skipping back to scales and long tones and on these etudes, you know what's great about this guy, about this tuner? You can also play the drone. And so that way it's working on your aural skills, A-U-R-A-L, and that's how you hear the pitches. So it's good to, to look at the little uh, pin in the middle of the, the tuner to see if you're visually in tune. But at some point, you really have to listen because when you're in band, you know, you're not going to have these to kind of just look at and look if it's red or green and whether you're in tune or not. But you want to be sure that you're in tune with the other people in the band. You want to make sure you're listening down to the tuba and that you're in tune with them or whoever the lowest voice is. So sometimes I might have the tuner go on and I can change this and make it go, OK, I'm going to put on the A because this line's an A minor. It starts on an A. play with that A and work on my ears, you know, my ear training and all those skills that go with that. So really focusing on that, right? And maybe I would work on the articulation a little bit more. Another example of a line here in this a, uh, in one of these etudes, a little bit later, I have one on the same page that's going to have more uh, markings on the notes, such as staccato, tenutos, accents. So I can really listen to these and how they go. So maybe there were different things for me to listen to in that one, but I really try to find tune. I mean, and you can do this with all your band music too, uh, finding different books. Okay. Uh, in my regiment, then after that, then I go into solo music, okay, which can be whatever interests you pretty much. Okay. I play a lot of classical music and that's just the realm I've dealt with, but I've also played, you know, doing jazz on my bassoon. Yeah, maybe it sounds funny to you, but hey, whatever goes for you. Uh, there's plenty of things that you can find. 
uh, reading trombone music, that's, that works too, a cello music, everything can work. It's all in bass clef on that concert key kind of stuff. So finding those fun things for you to play too, because this is fun. It just is. So then, uh, so I just want to address kind of a couple more questions that are commonly asked from students. Okay. So sometimes um, people come in and they're playing for a bit and then your bassoon's making a gurgly sound. Like there sounds like there's water in there. Oh. Take off the vocal and you blow it through the other end. And you get that out of there. Sometimes water can build up the speaker keys and that's just blowing out of it. So getting those sounds, that'll help you sound a little pure on the bassoon, pure bassoon tone. A lot of students will ask, well, I'm having issues with my low notes. You've really got to learn to open up and how I tell my students is, if you've ever watched Finding Nemo, you want to talk like Dory when she goes, oh, I'm talking like a whale, and really open up like that. And then just working your way down. If your lowest note you can play is the low F, start there and just by spring down. Get used to really opening up, okay, in your oral cavity here and down in your throat, down in your abdominal muscles. Working on that. The higher notes, it's a little bit the opposite. You don't want to eat the reed too much and have your lips up to the wire. One, you can kind of hurt yourself by cutting them on the wire. Uh, but you really want to focus more on the corners as you're playing higher. And really focus on these abdominal muscles. Okay? Corners, abdominal muscles. Huge for bassoon playing. Okay? Another thing, cracking notes. We don't want to crack notes. And what I'm talking about is when you try to drop the octave and then you're going. We're going. And there's that little hesitation between it, that little cracking sound. So making sure that we're practicing our octaves, okay? And making them very smooth. Maybe you've started flicking. Maybe you've never heard that term before. And that's okay. Uh, you can always reach out to some bassoon players, to your band director, to people at Hype Music, and ask these questions. Yeah. So uh, if you've never heard of it, it's just using these thumb keys. There's different keys for different notes, and they should just be part of the fingering. And that's what I teach all of my students. <laughs> Making a lot smoother transition, minimizing those cracking notes. Uh, a lot of kids will come in and say, I just don't like my tone. My tone's not good. It's my read. Okay, fair enough. It could be part of the read. But you also want to work on making good tone from these abdominal muscles. And you know what? We talked about it earlier. Long tones. They work wonders. And then you want to think about producing a good tone all the time you're playing. It'll make playing a lot more fun if you do these kind of, you know, harder things to do that take a little bit more work. It'll make playing a lot easier. People will love to listen to you because you'll make this beautiful bassoon sound. Initially, when you play bassoon, it may not have the best sound. My dad used to run into my room every time I practiced when I was a junior high and say, is that a moose? He literally did that. But you, you just keep on working at it, and you get to that beautiful singing bassoon range. I love the bassoon for that. Okay, the last thing, a uh, common thing is my band director keeps telling me to play louder or vice versa. You know, I can't play as soft as, you know, these clarinets that are playing, and my band director keeps telling me to play softer. Okay. Bassoon is a hard instrument to get a full dynamic range. There's nothing, you know, I can't say it's not. And so practicing those long tones will really help and work on building that dynamic range. I wasn't able to play as loud as I could overnight. It's just constantly working at it, but you don't want to play too soft where the note just disappears. You've got to work and have those abdominal muscles going. So you can play as soft as going or loud. And you're never going to play as loud as a trombone, and you're never going to play soft as a clarinet. And that's just the fact of it. But we keep working as close as we can. Same with technique. We'll never play as fast as a saxophone player can. But we keep working on it. And that's why you do things like scales and etudes. So you just keep going through it, keep chugging along. And that's how bassoon kind of works, you know? If you have any questions, you can always reach out. Um, I work at Hyde Music, so you can always contact that if you have private teachers.
great. Look into that with, you know, bassoon. Reach out to your band director. Um, whether they know the answer or maybe they need to reach out to someone, they can do that. So don't feel bashful. And then the other thing that's great is just to watch more videos, learning what bassoon should sound like and keep going with that. All right, everyone, Michael Pittman. Uh, and join us every Tuesday and Thursday throughout the remainder of the 2020 uh, summer season. And uh, we will have more to So thanks again, Mike. Yeah. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. And, uh, we'll check in with you guys next Tuesday. Have a good one.